To be rational is to look the universe in the face and not flinch. The universe, as has been observed before, is an unsettlingly big place, a fact which for the sake of a quiet life most people tend to ignore. My goal is simple. It is complete understanding of the universe, why it is as it is and why it exists at all. The effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that lifts human life a little above the level of bars and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. The universe is not to be narrowed down to the limits of the understanding, which has been men's practice up to now, but the understanding must be stretched and enlarged to take in the image of the universe as it is discovered. Every notion that any man, dead, living or unborn, might form as to the universe will necessarily prove wrong. The universe is wider than our views of it. Huddled together in our little earth, we gaze with frightened eyes into the dark universe. In the universe, the difficult things are done as if they are easy. Everything in the universe is within you. Ask all from yourself. Stop acting so small. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. There is no other universe except the human universe, the universe of human subjectivity. Philosophy is written in this grand book, the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze. It is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which one wanders about in a dark labyrinth. Now, my suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in any philosophy. That is the reason why I have no philosophy myself, and must be my excuse for dreaming. The universe has no purpose and no plan. It seems to me that, perhaps, creation is not fettered by rules, that all the hubbub, meeting and mingling are blind happenings of fate. It is very hard to realize that this present universe has evolved from an unspeakably unfamiliar early condition, and faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. There is no reason to assume that the universe has the slightest interest in intelligence, or even in life. Both may be random accidental byproducts of its operations, like the beautiful patterns of a butterfly's wings. The insect would fly just as well without them. The universe is a vast, amazing, seething dynamo which has no discernible purpose except to keep on churning. From quarks to quasars, it's alive with incredible power, but it seems utterly indifferent to any moral laws. It destroys as blindly as it nurtures. The universe is not hostile, nor yet is it friendly. It is simply indifferent. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. 
During the minute it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are being slowly devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst and disease. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. The universe may have a purpose, but nothing that we know suggests that. If so, this purpose has any similarity to ours. Although the universe is under no obligation to make sense, students in pursuit of the PhD are. In my youth, I regarded the universe as an open book, printed in the language of physical equations, whereas now it appears to me as a text written in invisible ink, of which in our rare moments of grace we are able to decipher a small fragment. There are no longer any absolute directions in space. The universe has lost its core. It no longer has a heart, but a thousand hearts. The universe is like a machine in which the motion of certain parts is determined by that of others. Only nothing is determined about the motion of the whole machine. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Had we never seen the stars and the sun and the heaven, none of the words which we have spoken about the universe would ever have been uttered. Nothing is accidental in the universe. This is one of my laws of physics except the entire universe itself, which is pure accident, pure divinity. It is possible that our race may be an accident in a meaningless universe, living its brief life uncared for on this dark, cooling star. But so, and all the more, what marvelous creatures we are! What fairy story, what tale from the Arabian Nights of the Jinns, is a hundredth part as wonderful as this story of Simeon's. It is so much more heartening too than the tales we invent. A universe capable of giving birth to so many accidents is, blind or not, a good world to live in, a promising universe. All the scientists hope to do is describe the universe mathematically, predict it and maybe control it. The philosopher, by contrast, seems unbecomingly ambitious. He wants to understand the universe, to get behind phenomena and operation and solve the logically prior riddles of being, knowledge and value. But the artist, and in particular the novelist, in his essence, wishes neither to explain nor to control nor to understand the universe. He wants to make one of his own and may even aspire to make it more orderly, meaningful, beautiful and interesting than the one God turned out. What's more, in the opinion of many readers of literature, he sometimes succeeds. Cosmologists and the rest of us may have to forego attempts at understanding the universe and simply marvel at its infinite complexity and strangeness. There is an enormous variety of things that we never dreamt of, like black holes, pulsars, quasars, all these unbelievably active goings-on in the universe. In Aristotle's time, the universe was supposed to be quiescent. It was supposed to be perfect and peaceful, and nothing ever happened in the celestial sphere, and that remained true. 
Throughout all the revolutions, it remained the general view of astronomers through Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and everybody else until just the last 30 years and now we know it's not like that at all. In fact, the universe is full of violent events and fantastic strong gravitational fields and collapsed objects and huge outpouring of energy. The things we understand least are the quasars, the most violent and energetic objects in the universe and they are totally mysterious and they are rather frequent and nobody ever dreamt that they existed. Even after they were found, it took a long time before people took them seriously. Nature's imagination is always richer than ours. The significance of man is that he is that part of the universe that asks question. What is the significance of man? He alone can stand apart imaginatively and, regarding himself and the universe in their eternal aspects, pronounce a judgment. The significance of a man is that he is insignificant and is aware of it. We are taught by great actions that the universe is the property of every individual in it. If desire lends a grace to whatsoever be the object of it, then the desire of the unknown makes beautiful the universe. The complexity of the universe is beyond expression in any possible notation. Lift up your eyes, not even what you see before you can ever be fully expressed. Close your eyes, not even what you see now. If there is one important result that comes out of our inquiry into the nature of the universe, it is this. When, by patient inquiry, we learn the answer to any problem, we always find, both as a whole and in detail, that the answer thus revealed is finer in concept and design than anything we could ever have arrived at by a random guess. The universe seems to me infinitely strange and foreign. At such a moment, I gaze upon it with a mixture of anguish and euphoria, separate from the universe, as though placed at a certain distance outside it. I look and I see pictures, creatures that move in a kind of timeless time and spaceless space, emitting sounds that are a kind of language I no longer understand or even register. The diversity of the phenomena of nature is so great and the treasures hidden in the heavens so rich, precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. The universe, as far as we can observe it, is a wonderful and immense engine. Its extent, its order, its beauty, its cruelty make it alike impressive. If we dramatize its life and conceive its spirit, we are filled with wonder, terror and amusement. So magnificent is that spirit, so prolific, inexorable, dramatical and dull. This truth within thy mind rehearse that in a boundless universe is boundless better, boundless worse. We will first understand how simple the universe is when we recognize how strange it is. The answer to the great question of life, the universe and everything is 42. If we do discover a complete unified theory of the universe, it should be in time be understandable in broad principle by everyone, not just a few scientists. Then we shall all, philosophers, scientists and just ordinary people, be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exists. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we should know the mind of God.